All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, coming back with another fantastic guest. This is going to be a super fun conversation right before we hit record. And actually, we had a conversation last week even to get to know each other a little bit better. And the conversation we were having then, we wish we would have hit record then because the, the nuggets <laughs> of wisdom that were coming out between the two of us was a lot of fun, and which tells me that this conversation is also going to be a lot of fun and hopefully a lot of value for you, the listener today. So today I have with us Martin Salama. So Martin is the best-selling author of the book War to Warrior. Inside that book, he focuses on helping you create balance in your life, break the chains holding you back, and helping you uncover your greatness. He's also the architect of the Warrior's Life Code, where he helps frustrated people quickly shift their mindset and uncover their greatness so they can live their true potential and enjoy life. He's a life coach. He's got a coaching program that I didn't touch base on here in the little intro, but we'll talk a little bit more about that, that coaching program that he's got as well. But he's coming to us from Brooklyn, New York. Is that correct? Brooklyn, New York? That's right. Brooklyn's in the house. Brooklyn is in the house. So before we get into this, I've just, I, and I mentioned this to you on the, the conversation call we had the other day that I've got, you're now the third main connection that I've made with this New York city, New York area and the whole giants, Yankees, Rangers connection. Giants, versus... Yankees, Rangers, Knicks. <laughs> so we were talking about the, so I'm in Indiana. We were just talking about the Knicks and Pacers matchup that's going on. Uh, depending <laughs> on when this episode launches, we can have a debate whether or not who was winning with and who should have won which game or whatever. But I just wanted to point that out. So I've got another friend that is on the other side of the, of the Jets, the Mets and the Islanders. But I, the fascinating part is I found out that that's all true. I keep asking these New York guys. I've got another friend, yeah. Joel Solomon. He's a Yankees uh, Giants fan, I believe, right? So it's like it's just it's just interesting how it's all two the different... different camps, right? Two totally <laughs> and, different camps. If you're in you the guys... Yankees Giants Rangers camp, you're in the winners camp. <laughs> right? so, Saying you're a Met fan, you're admitting you're a loser. So, wow, my friend Greg, I'm going to have a conversation with him tomorrow. I'm going to wow, Greg, if you're listening to this, my friend, I hope you're still my friend. That's coming from Martin Salama. He's from Brooklyn, New York. No, he'll and... admit he's a loser too. Don't worry. <laughs> I actually saw him post out there the other day that he went to a he's down in Tampa area and he went to a Mets Tampa game, and so he was like wearing the Mets shirt and all that good stuff. So yeah, if you would have saw that, you would he be calling him a loser i guess huh <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> poor greg you're not here to defend yourself i apologize so anyways without further ado like i said this is gonna be a fun conversation we're gonna have a lot of fun today talking about mindset abundance uh the warrior's life code all kinds of fantastic things martin you know, welcome to the show man thank you thank you so much and you know it's funny we were talking before about awareness mm. and there's a difference between self-awareness and self-consciousness and that's exactly what the yankees and mets are Yankees are self-aware and the Mets are self-conscious. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that going down this road of talking about sports was going to take us to, to the Mets no. <laughs> and the Yankees being a comparison. There. That's, that's, right, right. that's awesome. I had so, to yeah. do it. It was just, yeah. it was a lake. <laughs> I, I know. I know. And I, I did. I, I, I fed it to you, right? I got the assist. I don't even know if right. I was trying, but I got the assist. That's awesome. Right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> So this is going to be a lot of fun. So take a second. And obviously we know now you're from Brooklyn, New York, and the teams that yeah. you root for and all those kinds of great things. But <laughs> start from the top and go as deep as you'd like. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, last year I turned 60. Hmm. You know, uh, I feel great about that. And I've, I've told my kids that I've hit the midpoint of my life, that hmm. I have another 60 to go. And I honestly believe that. You know, if you start thinking that you're on the way down, you are on the way down. So I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at I'm, I'm starting new chapters now and I'm looking forward to moving forward. I'm looking forward to moving forward literally that way. And I can't say that that's who I was my whole life. Okay. I would put on that facade. I would make people think that I was the happiest guy out there. Kind of like uh, Smokey Robinson, the tears of a clown, you know, where people think you're really happy, but there's really stuff going on underneath. And for many years, that's who I was. And uh, I can easily say that that started when I was a kid. When I was around 10 years old, I had a tragedy in my life. Uh, um, you see this picture right up here. Hmm. This picture yeah. is my brother, Michael. Uh, when he was about five years old, he was killed by a school bus. And, and that day changed my life. Uh, I didn't realize it right away, but that that was the day. But uh, I came from a family of four older sisters, and then myself, and then my brother. 
So I'm looking and saying, okay, great. Me and Michael, we're going to set the world on fire together. I've got my brother. We're going to do it. That's what it is. And when he, when he was killed, uh, it wasn't in those days, you know, back in the seventies, it wasn't a thing of, oh, let's take everybody to therapy. You know, we all just held it within ourselves. So I told myself a story from a young age that I have to make sure that my parents never feel any kind of sadness like that again. So I, I could look back now and realize that 10, 11 years old is when I started to form this person who I became for the next 40 years of being a people pleaser. Because in my life, I felt like it was my job to make sure that my parents were always happy. Not only that they weren't sad, that they were happy and that I, and that I could say, oh, I'm doing whatever they want. And for many years, that's what I did. And now looking back, and most people pleasers will never tell you that they're a people pleaser. They go, I just like to make everybody happy. And that was me. But I didn't realize that it, what a people pleaser really is, is it's at their own detriment that they do things. Because they're trying to make everybody else happy, hoping that they were going to make themselves happy as well. But it took me almost 40 years to realize that not only was I not making them happy, but I was miserable. Nobody was happy. And uh, it took going through a lot of ups and downs in my life to get to that point of understanding that. And it was at a very, very low point in my life that I started to uncover these things that I realized. And realize, looking back, most people will tell you it's at those low points in their lives that they realize what's not working and why is it not working? Because as long as things are going well, like, you know, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to change what's happening. And uh, it, it becomes a thing of, you know, I'm doing it, but I'm making millions. So why should I stop? Because I'm not happy. It doesn't matter as long as I'm doing well. And it took to be at a low point. And I got to that low point in an interesting year of 2008. Remember that year, Randy? I do remember that year. Yeah. Well, for the four or five years before that, my wife and I were working on a project to build a multi-million dollar tennis club and health, health club in New Jersey. And uh, that actually came as a result of me being a people pleaser. So it was early 2000s and I had just closed the business and my wife turned to me and said, and we had residual income and stuff like that. She said, well, now that you did that, you know, maybe you should start looking for something else to do. And recently I started playing tennis, my wife said to me, and I could never find courts. There's never any court times available, only late at night, eight, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. She goes, maybe we should look to open up some tennis, tennis uh, courts. So I'm like, okay, now I got to tell you the irony of it all. As much as I love sports, I am the worst athlete in the world. <laughs> So I'm not an athlete. I'm an athletic supporter. <laughs> <laughs> that was a layup that I'm not going to take. That was, yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah. Most of the done. young people are like, so what? He supports athletes. That's not what it means, guys. <laughs> I understand. And that's where I'm just going to let that one go. That's uh, it. That's it. Yeah, maybe we'll it's come back to that It's actually from a great movie. It's from, it's from the movie Grease. That's if right. you can't be an athlete, be an athletic supporter. Athletic support. <laughs> no, but anyway, the irony was I was not an athlete. Uh, and she says, let's open up a tennis court, tennis place. So I said to her, okay, I'll let's, let's look into this. Uh, let's do a feasibility study. So I found the guy who does feasibility studies and he comes back six months later. Yeah, it's a great idea. You do well there with tennis. However, if you're thinking about making some real profit, just doing tennis is not enough. You've got to have ancillary things. You've got to have like a health club so that you have a monthly membership. You've got to have a spa and other things and, and make it a destination area. So in 2003 or four, when we started this, okay, we set up this, that, that, then we find the land, we go start doing anything. What started out as seven or eight tennis courts turned into a 110 square foot facility of what it would have been and about a $15 million project. Wow. All right. So we start down this road and we start, okay, feasibility study, uh, go get the land, go get the approvals for the city, go find an architect, an engineer and all this. And we're going back to the city and the city's like, yeah, this looks good, but you got to do this and you got to change this. And I'm going into the bank and I'm saying, guys, this is what I'm looking to do. They go, great. When you get the approval from the city, come back and we'll fund it. Fantastic. Now it's 2004, 2005, 2006. I've gotten investments. I've gotten loans. I'm refinancing my house. And back then going to the banks, was like going to Costco. 
You know, the old ladies on the edge of the, on the end of the aisles giving you samples. That's what the bank was doing. They said, come refinance your house. And then six months later, we finance it again. We'll, we'll give you a new valuation. Like fantastic, beautiful. And I did that. You want, we gave you uh, 80%. Come in, we'll give you 20% uh, home equity loan as well for the rest of it. And, and, but the numbers all made sense. So we're going down. And finally, in the summer of 2008, we get all the approvals. Going to the bank, I'm like, okay, guys, you said what I'm ready. Here I am. I'm over $3 million in now between my money and the investors and the lenders, people who loan me money, because I wanted to get right into the ground when we started. All right. I go into the bank, the bank, like, we're not lending. I'm like, what are you talking about? You've been telling me you can't wait. Well, things are changing. We're not lending the way we were back then. Back then was only a year ago. <laughs> you know, it's not like a decade. Well, sorry. Comes to September 2008, a month later, Bernie Madoff, the subprime loans, the entire financial world crashes like a house of cards. And where am I, Randy? I'm the joker on the bottom of the deck with the, with the knife in my head almost. That's how bad it was. I wasn't laughing. And I went into a depression for about a year. And looking back now, I could easily say it was a, it was a situational depression. You know, thank God. It, I, I went on things like, well, Butrin. I went to therapy. I went to even coaching. And it took me about a year to get through this. And while this was going on, I stopped paying my mortgage. I stopped paying my car payments. And about three, four months later, my son says, Dad, look outside. They were towing away my BMW. Hmm. That never happened to me before. I run out to the car. I'm like, what's going on? He goes, well, you haven't made your payments. We're taking your car. I'm like, well, can I take the stuff out of my car? Nope, sorry. We already hooked it up. Bye. And whatever was in the car went with it. It was a, it was a tough thing to handle. And I was depressed for about a year. And when I finally started to get out of my depression, I said, okay, what am I going to do now? And I looked around and I said, I've been a businessman my whole life. And, I, and I, as much as I was up and down with it, I never loved doing it. I never loved the sale. So I said, what do I want to do now? And I thought about my life and I realized I was always happiest when I was working in community organizations as a leader. And as a leader, people come in and say, Martin, I can't do what you're doing. I'm like, but Randy, I don't want you to do what I'm doing. I want you to figure out what you're good at and I'll help you figure that out and give us an hour here, two hours there, whatever it is. And I would help them and I would figure out their potential. And I realized that that was coaching because I had gotten coached over the last few years before that. As a matter of fact, you and I had talked about Robert Kiyosaki. I was coached by a Kiyosaki coach back then. So I looked into it and I found this great coaching school that I wanted to go to. And I go into the school, happens to, it's, it's a, a, an international organization and their headquarters are two miles away from me in New Jersey. Wow. Like nothing happens by accident. There's no coincidences. Right. And I go in and I tell him, I tell the chief financial officer, I said, look, I want to come to this school, but I can't afford to pay you. And I can't afford, I can't go out and get a loan. I know you said you can help me get funding. Nobody's going to give me a loan uh, funding right now. I'm being totally honest with you. I said, because my credit score is terrible. He says, okay, I'll make a deal with you. Let's come up with a number that you can do every month. And you'll pay me that. He says, but you don't get your certification until you're fully paid off. I said, you got it. You got a deal. He took a chance on me. I understood his parameters and I went with it. So now it's about two months before I'm going to start coach training. And it's my 24th wedding anniversary. And Randy, you know what my wife gave me for an anniversary gift? No. What was that? She said, I want a divorce. Wow. I was like, oh my God. Just when I'm starting to get up, I'm down again. It's like, why does everything keep happening to me? I got to tell you, every emotion that you could imagine, I felt. Anger, sadness, abandon, everything. I had to make a decision. Do I still want to go forward with coaching? And I think God whispered in my ear and said, you know what? You really should go to coaching. Because not only is it going to help other people, but it'll help you figure out you. I was like, that sounds interesting. Literally, I felt like maybe God told it to me a dream. Uh, yeah, I'm crazy, but well, we'll go with that. 
And they sent me a list about a month before of books. They said, read a couple of these books. And one of them was The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And when I read that second agreement, don't take anything personally, I felt like he was talking directly to me. He was telling me a secret that everybody had been telling me my whole life, even my dad who passed away in 2002. For years, 2001, he told me, don't worry what everybody's thinking. Just do. Just do what you think. But the other side of me, the, 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 the people pleaser side of me, would always get in my own way. But when he said it, to, when I read it in that book, I was so ready for it at that time that I was like, oh, you mean I don't have to have the world on my shoulders? I don't have to make sure that everybody's happy so that I could be happy? And then I went to coach training and I started to learn all these things about me that I was a people pleaser. And with that came a few other things that I took everything personally, that I, uh, I was a control freak. I needed the recognition. I needed everybody to tell me, wow, what a great job you're doing. And when all those things weren't happening, I also knew that I was going to lose it very quickly. I had a very short temper. I would react to everything because everything was out of balance. My head and my heart were not in balance. And that was my way of expressing how I felt. And I started to understand that all of these things are controlling who I am. And if I want to become something different, I've got to learn how to control who I am instead of allowing my emotions to control who I am. That's the hardest part. That's been the hard part for me as well, is the awareness piece of where of being aware, becoming aware maybe is maybe a better way to put it, that right. it's not necessarily who you are. It's not necessarily who you want to be within your family or your surroundings or all of that, right? It's the hardest part, in my opinion. Yes. Just curious how that was for you when you were, it's almost like a mirror is being shown in front of you, right? And it's like the reflection back to you isn't anywhere what you thought it could be, should be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Talk no, I looked at the mirror. Bit. I'm like, who is this guy? Mm. Right. And that's where my awareness and I, I, cre- I, I, the money I spent in coaching, and by the way, I paid it all off. I did get my, 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 my certification, but the money I spent there, if I never coach another person was the best money I've ever spent because it got me to understand who I am and understand that I didn't have to be who everybody said I had to be. I could be whoever I wanted to be, you know? And that awareness started coming in. And over the years, I started to understand that there's a difference between self-awareness and self-conscious. And we talked about it before about the Yankees and Mets, right? We did. We we, we got a little heavier, so it's okay to bring a little (laughs) levity back in. But if you don't mind, as you said, I I wrote a book. It's called Warrior to Warrior. Mm -hmm. And for all those out there, the Brooklyn accent screws it up. It's W-O Warrior to WA warrior. Okay. And, uh, I also, as a result of the book and as my coaching and what my book and my, and my coaching is all about is the experiences I've gotten over the years from my clients and myself and what's worked for help me to become and help my clients become better of who they were to who they are now. So I also put together a card deck called worry to warrior. And the card deck is really a, a great way to get snippets Whether you've read the book, whether you haven't read the book, it's great either way. So one of the cards talks about the difference between self-awareness and self-conscious. So if you don't mind, can I read the card? Please. Okay, so self-consciousness comes from a place of negative energy, guilt, conflict, and doubt. Self-consciousness is more outward directed. It's being more concerned about what others are thinking of you and how the situation is going to affect you. You probably react to uncomfortable situations instead of respond. When you're self-conscious, you're questioning your decisions. You're second-guessing yourselves, allowing other people's opinions and judgments to sway your own judgment. Self-consciousness comes from a mindset of lack, complaining, and blaming. Self-awareness comes from a place of positive energy, acceptance, contentment, self-assuredness. Self-awareness is more inward facing. You have an accurate and realistic understanding of how you are responding to situations and how you feel about things. It enables you to approach interactions and circumstances from a more balanced, richer stance. Self-awareness comes from a mindset of abundance, taking responsibility and gratitude. 
So what do you think of that? I love all that. Yeah, I need that card because that's, I, as you're reading that, the whole entire time I'm thinking that's exactly what I'm trying to do personally, right? A, a lot of my, I can't, and I won't say that I've had a lot of coaching. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had some coaches, I guess, but not maybe into the extent that you've had. And so a lot right. of mine has just been self-discovery, like through reading, through listening, through basically what you just shared, right? I'll hear something like that. And that 100% resonates with who I was to who I'm trying to become as well. That self-consciousness versus self-awareness, such an important piece that if you can get, if you can just sit back and just grasp that even a little bit how different your life can be moving forward. At least it has been for me. And it sounds like it has been for you as well. Yeah. Yeah. It has been. And many people come to me and they go, well, I'm self, I'm self aware. And then when I break it down for them, they're like, Oh wait, maybe what I'm looking at as being self aware is really being more self-conscious because to me, self-conscious is ego driven and it's really wanting to please others. Whereas self self awareness is humility and making sure you're taking care of yourself first. So, yeah, those are great examples. Can you give us a few more? So maybe somebody's listening to us right now and they're like really trying to think of themselves, right? Where am I? Where do I fit on that spectrum of, because I think you'd be a little bit of, of both kind of, right? I don't think yeah. maybe 100% one way or the other, right? You kind no, of flow not, back and I'd forth. I'd love to think that I'm I'm 100% self-aware, but there are moments that I slip into self-consciousness. <laughs> and I admit it, I do as well. But at the same time, it's it's once again, becoming aware of it happening back and forth, which then it almost gives you control. It's like you get yeah. in the driver's seat of your life versus life kind of pushing you around side to side. It really uh, does. Yeah. Any, any other examples of people that are suffering uh, and maybe suffering is not the right word, but maybe struggling with the idea of, of self-consciousness. Well, yeah, it's self like doing something because I talked earlier about your heart and your head being in alignment, right? When they're not in alignment, that means there's something off and you may be doing it for the wrong reasons. And, you know, one of the other things I talk about is very, very often we rationalize that the things we're doing are, are the right things to do. And I've come and there's another card that I'm looking for now in my, in my deck, which talks about the word rationalize. Okay. So to me, rationalize is really two words. It's rational lies. Whenever you think you may be doing something that goes against your values, you will rationalize all the reasons why it's okay. What you're really doing is lying to yourself that it's rational to think that. They're nothing more than rational lies. So I could put it on a very simple plane like this. You wake up in the morning and you go, yeah, I, I know I should exercise today, but I'm really tired. Are you really tired or you're looking for a reason to get out of it? Are you rational? Are you coming up with a rational lie so that you can rationalize that it's okay that you don't exercise? So it's simply just coming up with the question and questioning kind of where you're at in that moment. Right. right? Exactly. But having a serious conversation, allowing yourself to not take what you're thinking at, at, at full. I mean, I don't even, I'm trying to think of the right word. It's like, it's not coming to me, but at the same time, I, the thoughts come into my mind. Yeah. It's just a matter of just questioning it to the point where then you can come up with a different answer. Right. Are, are, you coming, are, you, are you allowing yourself to tell yourself a rational lie? And it's about being honest with yourself and saying, you know what? I don't want to exit today. So instead of my coming up with an excuse, just say the truth. I choose not to exercise. And I understand the circumstances and, and the consequences of not exercising. Right? I choose not to go to work today. I understand that if I don't go to work today, I may not have a job tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's understanding what those consequences are, right? And be able to exactly. make the decisions based on those consequences. Exactly. And here's where, what I said earlier, I, after my wife hit me with the divorce, I said, why is everything happening to me? And right there was a rationalize. It was me blaming everybody else for what was going on in my life. 2008 happened. It was, it was everybody else's fault. Maybe I could have avoided it. Maybe, I don't know. But I now say that everything happens through me because happening to me means I'm blaming everybody else. Happening through me means I'm willing to take the reality, good, bad, or indifferent as to what happens. And that's a conscious decision. So conscious one thing decision. I say with the, with the Rich Mind Podcast, that's kind of what I stand for is winning within. And what I mean by that is that, once again, it's taking the awareness 
of what's going on inside of you. And then your outside world is a reflection of that awareness of what's going on inside of you. Right. Exactly. Right there in a nutshell. So that's where, yeah, that's what I try to talk about a lot on the podcast from my own personal experiences. But that's where I also love bringing on folks like you that are working on that as well. So talk about how you were working through your rational eyes, right? With the situation with your divorce. Sounds like obviously you had some challenges with your businesses and that type of thing. Talk about how you were, were able to work through them. You, you said you went through some coaching. Mm-hmm. Were there some techniques or were there some anything? I'm, yeah, I'm really, yeah. I'm, I'm grasping at it. What, what were some of the things? So people are maybe realizing that, okay, maybe I'm suffering through some of this as well, right? Yeah. But what can I do? That's kind of the question I have for you. What were some of the things 100%, you did that kind of helped 100%. yourself? So I talked about how I, I, when I was breaking down who I was and I said, I would lose my temper pretty quick. I would react to everything. And I even talked about it on the self-aware self-conscious card that you react as opposed to respond. So once I started to be aware, not self-aware, aware of these things being in my life, it was now up to me to decide what was I going to do with it. And what I was learning, the new skills that I was learning in coaching, I needed to learn how to apply them to myself and then be able to help apply them to my clients. So what I would end up doing is learning from the coaching and then adapting it so that it made sense for me in some way. And uh, a few years ago when I was putting my course together in the middle of uh, COVID, happened to be, and I was like, I'm taking the things that I've taught, that I've coached, and now making it a regular hardcore course. And I'm saying to myself, I was working with a coach. Because you know what? You can't do these things alone. You just can't. There's always got to be coaches in your life. That's how I believe. It could be coaches, mentors, people you look up to, whatever. There's got to be someone. And I I was telling this stuff to, I think it was to one of my kids. You could go alone, but you can't grow alone. You need a team around you. So I was on the phone with, on a Zoom with with my coach at the time. And he's saying, so how did you go from being somebody that reacted to everything to changing. And I said something, I said, you remember when we were in school, when our kids went to school and the firemen came into the class and taught fire safety. And they said, children, if you remember nothing, remember these three words, stop, drop, and roll. Stop what you're doing. Drop to the ground under the smoke and roll to safety. He said, yeah, okay. I said, well, that's what I did. I, whenever I find myself in a situation that I was usually should have been a confrontation, but because of who I was turned into a confrontation where I would just get into fights with everybody and that had to do with what was going on inside of me. I said, I've got to change that. So I changed it to stop, think, and respond. Hmm. Okay, stop, drop, and roll. Stop, think, and respond. Stop what you're doing and think about what's going to happen next. Right, so stop. Someone's coming after you, and your default tendency is in your mind they're coming to attack you. So I'm going to go right on the attack, and I'm going to shoot first and ask questions later. You know what happens when you shoot first, Randy? There's nobody left to ask questions to. <laughs> right, you killed them. True. Even if you didn't kill them literally, metaphorically, you've killed them because now that you've closed their mind to whatever you have to say. So instead, stop. Don't react the way you've always reacted. Step two, think. Think about what's going on. Maybe that person's having a bad bad day. Am I taking it personally? What else is going on around me? And I found that most anger comes from fear. When When you're afraid of something, you either run and hide or you fight. But there also could be Let me think about what's going on here and see what's happening. And instead of reacting, I said, okay, I'm going to think about it and come up with a, and sometimes I'll say to that person, you know what? That's interesting. Let me get back to you. First thing is you've caught them off guard. So like, wait a minute, this is the guy that always attacks me and he's now not. Second thing is you're giving yourself a chance to think about what's the best way to move forward. And then respond. Okay. So stop, think and respond. And what happens is, is that over time, 
it'll start to get better and better. Now, is it the first time I ever did it worked? No freaking way. And does it happen all the time? Does it work 100% of the time? No. But it happens more often now that I go through my stop, think, and respond than before when I was just reacting like a nuclear reactor and leaving fallout all over the place that I had to go fix later. And it's interesting because you'll appreciate this because we were talking about the Knicks and the Pacers. (laughs) So here I am. I'm putting this together. And I'm thinking people like to have a way of keeping score, keeping, seeing where they are. So I have to come up with, you know, a, a tangible way. So I came up with the cards. I came up with the system. I said, okay, I'm thinking about it. And we were, we were in COVID, right, when this was going on. And so my wife's working from home. The kids are learning. I, by the way, I got married again. So my new wife and her kids are living in the house. And one day, her and her son go out to play a game. When I was a kid, it was called 5-3-1, a basketball game. You remember 5-3-1? I remember games similar to 531. I don't think we called it that, right? But right. It, I know where you're going with that. Yes. Right. So 531 is you take a free throw, you get five points. Then you get the rebound wherever it is, you throw it up, you get three points. And then you get a layup, you get one point. That's nine points. And if you did all three on one round, you get a bonus point, 10 points. So they went out to play 531. They come back in a little while later. I go, How was it? He go her son, who at the time was about thirteen. He says she beat me a hundred to nothing. I said, <laughs> "How is that possible?" <laughs> he goes, "Well, I kept on going for the fives, figuring I'll try to catch up." Besides the fact that the game's not played like that, I mean, why not go for the threes and one and try to catch up? You know, try to stay in the game. So I thought about it. I said, "You know what?" I could use 531 with stop, think, and respond by reversing it. So let's say somebody does something and you freak out and you didn't do anything right then and there. But the next day you thought about it. You went, wait a minute. Let me think about my my argument with Randy yesterday. You stopped. Give yourself one point. Now you thought about it. How can I do it differently the next time? Right, And you write it down. Stop. Uh, This is what happened. I had an argument with Randy yesterday and it was really bad. What could I do different? Write it down. Then, if you could pick up the phone and call Randy and say, Randy, I am so sorry for the way I overreacted. Please forgive me. With no buts. With no, I'm looking for anything back. With just an honest, truthful, I'm sorry. And hopefully next time I can do better. You give yourself the extra five points. Right? I love that. So so now, even if you're in the moment, let's say you did it, you stopped, but then you didn't think enough and you still reacted. Okay, go back and write on the scorecard. And it's a way of reinforcing and making the muscle memory start to work. So is this an actual scorecard or is it so the thought, because this is what I do. I do, it's a, I journal is what I do. That is my process is that I, every day I've gotten into the habit of journaling, but that's what I'll do is I, a lot of times I'll have uh, a situation where that I'll journal about that right. helps me think through the process, that's right? Before I then go, okay. I didn't know if that's the way way you have, but a I do have a scorecard. scorecard. You do have a scorecard. Of course you do. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and that comes along with this card deck that it's that in the card deck. It's in the book. It's in my course. It's all about what I do because you know what? So many times we were talking before in the self-awareness, self-consciousness card, about energy and things like that. And people say, oh, that's all woo-woo. And it is. But if you take it and come up with practical ways of getting through it, we're finding out more and more science is realizing a lot of the woo-woo is good stuff. But if you just let it leave it out there in the ether and do nothing about it, then it just stays woo-woo. But if you go and make it practical and come up with ways of taking these things you're feeling and doing something about it, now you're making a, a marked change in yourself. And it's a change that can last forever and generations to come. That's the amazing part. It really can. It could. But here's uh, so, the difference. You can't think that you did it once and that's it. You're good forever. Because it doesn't happen so that, over. 
No, you're right. So that's where my, that's a, okay. That's a perfect lead into the next question I was going to mention or ask you was that because you made the comment that it, it's not 100% accurate and that it doesn't work 100% of the time. Because I think that's where, I, and I think others kind of get that messed up thinking that, okay, if I make this switch, it's going to be, my life is just going to be perfect all the time. <laughs> what happens to me is I get triggered by a situation, a conversation, whatever it is that sends my mind racing to this negative place, which then begins to make me self-conscious, which then I need to be, yeah, exactly. And it's then, the okay. vicious cycle. Okay. So that's where I would love for you to share what I've, I've shared my experiences several times on the podcast. So anybody listening to me on the rich mind podcast knows kind of where I go with, <laughs> with the triggers and that kind of thing, but I'm just curious how that has been for you. So it sounds like you had a challenging childhood. You had a challenging adulthood through your business. And then obviously with your marriage life, but now that you've come through this other side of your being, be, trying to become self-aware when you get triggered, take me through the process. What, what, how does that feel? What is, yeah. What's going on in your mind at that moment? Yeah. So we, we, you know, just to go back a minute, we talked about life code and all that in the beginning. And to me, it's important for me to tell you this part before I tell you the next part. So for me, life, I turned into an ink acronym called live incredibly full every day. Right. Which means I want to have a happy life, but I also want to have a meaningful life. Happiness is self-care, self-love, even selfish. Meaningful is selfless. What are you doing for others? If you can have both of those things in your life every day, then, then you're, you're leading, living incredibly full every day. Right? So, and like you, I journal in a different way. I wake up every morning and I write down three things I'm grateful for. And this gets my day starting correctly. Right? So, I'm telling you that because I also use the word life to make a bunch of other acronyms. And one of them is something that helps me when I'm at those moments of feeling like I'm about to lose it. Okay. So this takes the stop, think and respond to a deeper level. So it's called the warrior's life code method to build your emotional strength and rule your actions instead of your emotions ruling you. Cause that's especially for people who are, have a short temper, their emotions are ruling them. They're having confrontations instead of conversations every single day. So I broke it down to four, four letters, L-I-F-E. Listen to your inner voice and acknowledge your emotions. So you're angry. Admit that you're angry. It's okay. You don't have to hide from it. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, apologize for it. Admit it. And there's, I, if you go to my website, it's called connectwithmartin.com. You can download a worksheet and a chart that help you get through this. Because again, it's about action steps. It's about practicality. So the worksheet, the, the, the chart has the words, the, the main types of emotions across the top. Happy, sad, angry, depressed, whatever it is. Then you go down and each one has its own column of, of strong emotions medium and light, but instead of emotion, they're feelings because emotions are what you feel in the moment and the feelings are what kind of an emotion is it, right? So for anger, are you enraged or are you just a little ticked off? So L, listen to your inner voice and acknowledge your emotions. I, identify your feelings. What kind of anger are you? What kind of sadness are you? And, and, and there's, it's all listed right there. And then the next one is F, find out why. Question yourself about those feelings and emotions. Why am I feeling this? What's going on? What's the situation? And am it, am, is it hurting me? Is it helping me? And all that. And then the last one is E, engage and change and take action. Now, it may mean take action right away, or it may mean I got to figure out what I'm going to do. So... You want a practical way I, that, that this worked for me? Please. So here I am. It's about two years after my divorce and my son is getting married. And my ex lives in New Jersey with uh, most of the kids. And I live in New York. Uh, I moved back to New York to Brooklyn where my, my, my mother lives, my sisters live. And I have that support group around me. Uh, so it's about two years in and my son's getting married and he goes to New Jersey for the weekend. Now, I come from a small uh, a Sephardic Jewish, Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn, very close knit. And uh, there's a custom, some, sometimes the Saturday before, the boy goes to synagogue, he gets called up to the Torah, 
there's blessings. And then afterwards you have a lunch for the, for the couple. So I just assumed we weren't doing it because I didn't hear anything. My son comes back for the weekend because he's living with me during the week because he's going to school in New York and he's destroyed. I'm like, what's wrong? He goes, I am so sorry. Mom made the lunch and didn't invite you. Everybody else was there. Her family, my wife's, my future wife's family, everybody was there and you weren't. Now, the old me, so I turned to him, I said, Caesar, thank you for telling me I'm not upset with you. Because number one, it wasn't his fault. The old me would have been upset at him, would have been upset at her, and would have gotten on the phone right there and ripped her a new one. Okay. Now, the wedding is three days away. What would have I have accomplished by doing this three days before the wedding? Everybody would have been upset. And it would all have come down to, oh, he's going back to his old, old ways of being a powder keg and not caring about anybody's feelings. It's all about Martin. So I thought about it and I said, let me pull out my life thinking here. Well, listen to your inner voice and acknowledge your emotions. I am angry. What kind of angry? The top of the list, enraged. <laughs> I, I identified, I was enraged. Why? She disrespected me. She did this, all these things. I wrote them all down. And then E, engage and change and take action. So instead of picking up the phone right there, I waited until two days after the wedding. Because I knew if I did it before the wedding, there would have been a cloud over the entire wedding and it would all have been my fault. And everybody would have said, there he goes again. So I waited until two days after the wedding. I called her up and I said, this is what you did. Whether she heard it or not didn't matter. And it was a controlled anger. I said, this is what you did. And this is the message you sent to our children and to the other side of the new family that's coming in that I mean nothing and that don't worry about, you know, disrespect him and all that. And I ended the conversation by telling her, thank you for divorcing. And when I said that, it was closure for me more than anything else. So it's going through that process. And I appreciate you sharing that story because that's, that's the thing. Sometimes in the moment, you can be heated. And if you're not aware, we've talked about self-awareness so much already today. Right. If you're not aware of the moment and feeling, because it's like your temperature will rise. I'm sure your heart was racing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we've all experienced those things, but it's a matter of when it's happening in real time, taking control, having control enough of your to implement these strategies that you're talking about. Right. Now, you noticed I didn't say don't get angry. <laughs> you did not. I did and not. You said you were, the, you, were, you were at the top of the list. <laughs> right. And, it's, it, and people think life coaching is about teaching people how not to be angry, not to be sad. No. It's about understanding how to respond when those emotions come up hmm. instead of react back to stop, think and respond. And that's what I did. I had a controlled anger. I actually went through it with my coach before, like a day before I said, this is what's going on. And I've decided to wait until after the wedding, the wedding's over now. And this is what I'm going to do. And I sort of rehearsed it. Not really. I just went through the motion with my coach and they said, great, you're ready to go. But had you not had that person sounding board, really, like the coach, what do you have any? I, mean, I maybe, probably I don't know if that's worth it. I, I still, I, I, I was aware enough of my emotions to know that I couldn't do it at, at that moment. But what I was going to say and how I was going to say it and how I was going to present it might have probably would have come out differently where I was attacking her as opposed to attacking what she did. Very good. Right. Very because good. that's what we do. You get heated moment, you attack the person, not what's going on. Which is to hence the control. You've got to have control. So I'm going to prod you a little bit more to see if there's another uh, story. I don't know if, I don't know if uh, you'll be, I'm sure you will. But as far as the, the goodness that comes of taking control, right? Of yeah. having the awareness. So I'm picturing yourself, let's call it 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, prior to all the personal development, all the things you've done to work on yourself and then who you are today. Right. Talk about how literally your life has changed for yourself and for your surroundings. It and really has. Yeah. Well, talk about that. So it's like, I think <laughs> sometimes people will, will come across and, and think about what we're talking about today, right? Or they'll come across somebody trying to encourage them to take control of their emotions and their right. self-awareness and that. And they're like, you know what? That's a bunch of garbage. That's, that's stupid. I don't want to do that. 
But you're living proof, as am I, right. that if you can actually do the work, the positive things that can come from it. Yeah. I would love for you to kind of share some of those yeah. things that have come Absolutely. doing the work, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So first thing is, when I went for that first weekend and they told me that you don't have to be who you think you have to be, you could be whoever you want to be, that got me to start understanding that the default tendencies that I had my whole life of, of being a reactor and taking things personally and and having to be a control freak didn't have to be. It's I decided that that's what they had to be. So now I had to decide that that's not what they had to be. So that was the beginning. And I'd love to say it happened overnight, but it took work and it took a lot of trial and error as well. So, but things got better. And, uh, you know, I got through that. And part of what was happening is, is I'm, I'm pulling back these layers and I'm learning to like myself and to love myself and to realize that I wasn't the whole reason the divorce failed. Because that was my mindset as a people pleaser thinking, what could I have done to make her love me, to make her not leave, all those things. So now I started to understand and I started to like myself and love myself. And I started dating, right? And I would go out on these dates and I would interview these women about their values without them realizing I was that's what I was doing. It was more of conversation and learning about what their values were because I learned through coaching that the values... Your values are very important and you shouldn't compromise them. What I realized was in my first marriage, my wife's and my, and my, uh, and my wife and my values were completely different and we were very codependent. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to find a woman that was just going to be just like my wife in a different body. And I'd go on these dates and no, 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 no good. One day, two dates, I'd find it out. And one day I went out on a date and she's checking off all the boxes. Go on another day, checking off the boxes. And this is going on. And about a month or so into it, I tell her, I got to tell you something. And you don't need to say it back to me, but I'm falling in love with you because I love who you are and that I love that you see me as I am and you're not trying to change me. Well, two weeks later, she told me she loved me too. Two years later, we've got married. And in June, 2024, which is around when this will come out, we'll be married for six years. Congratulations. Thank you. That's so a great that's story. Showing the other side, the good stuff. Yeah, it's it is the good stuff. So my wife and uh, we've been married now. We're coming up on twenty eight years, but she will say that there was a pre Randy. She, I don't know. I'm trying to think of the exact words she uses, right? But it's like the 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 amount of change that I've made. It's like it's night and day difference between who I was, say five ish as far as my age. I just turned fifty a week or two ago, so about fifteen years, right? of who I am today or even who I continue to become. It's like a completely, right. right. I say that was Martin 1.0 and this is Martin 2.0 and they may be a Martin 3.0. Who knows? (laughs) But when my, it doesn't stop. Right. Right. When my current wife hears stories about the old me, she goes, I've never seen any of that. I said, well, you're lucky. That's him 1.0. You don't have to know him. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, no. So I, I recently become Ding a grandfather. Dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> yeah. And that's where I, I hope that, that I don't ever bring back any of those past traits or just the way I used to be right. in, in his life. Um, yeah. The, yeah. We'll keep the 2.0 and the 3.0. We'll keep moving forward. That's the exactly. beautiful thing about the growth piece. So speaking of growth and you're coaching and you're, you're actively helping people every day, all day with all the, the things that you're doing. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, Talk about your coaching programs. Talk about love, your your passion for helping people understand and become aware of the things that we're talking about today. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I do love helping people. I love watching them when they get those aha moments and they realize that, wow, I'm really making a change and I can make this stick. It really means a lot. I have a couple of coaching programs. One where you could learn how to shift that mindset from lack to abundance self-conscious to self-aware and it's a coaching program and there's the book and there's the, 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 the cards as well. And you can get all that Go to connect with Martin.com. And over the last six months, I put together a program because over the last 10, 12, 14, 13, 14 years that I've been in coaching, lots of times I've gone into coaching programs that were what they said to me were they were done for you or done with you programs. And what I found them to be were done to you programs. Pay me all up front and we'll give you everything and we'll show you how to be a millionaire in three months. 
And I realized, number one, I only, I, of course, I want to have the millions of dollars. But more importantly, I want to make an impact on people's lives. And I want to help other people make impacts on people's lives and make money at the same time. So I put together a program that I called the Guaranteed Seven Figure Warrior Program. Because that's my word, warrior. And warrior, by the way, came from 2020 when the world shut down. Thanks to that little word, COVID. And I'm looking around and everybody's worried and I'm not. Mm. I'm like, why is everybody worried and I'm not? And I realized the 10, 12 years before that, going through my through 2008, my divorce, a weight uh, fluctuation like you can't imagine. And me coming out the other side stronger every single time made me realize that whatever comes up, I'm not going to be worried about it. So I said, I got into Facebook and I said, guys, I get it. Let me show you how to go from being a warrior to a warrior. Mm. Right. And to me, a warrior is whoever's come through the other side of adversity and is stronger for it. So I put this coaching program together and I use what I call a risk reversal strategy. I tell them I can get you to a million dollars within two years, seven figures within two years. And to show you that I believe in me and you, I'm only going to ask for 12 and a half percent now of my fee. And then when you start hitting financial goals, then you start to pay me the rest of the money. Because now I really am doing it with you and for you together. And you get the CRM built in and you get a workshop, a philanthropic workshop done for you. So for your audience, for your right fit client, so that you're making the impact and along the way making the money as well. Because it's great to make impact, but everybody thinks it's for free. No, everybody's got to make money. So the program itself, is it you're working with the coaches one-on-one? -on -one? You're, you're coaching well, them through the process as well? I do one-on-one well? -on -one coaching in a group setting. Okay. Okay. I'll have seven, eight people in a group, right? And we come to the calls and before and after they're doing their work, we, they're getting videos to do and homework to do to bring them up. Then they come to the coaching call. We go over what they got, what their questions are. And we do it in a group setting because Randy might have a question that Bob never thought of, or that Mary never thought of. And Mary may some, say something that Randy was thinking about, but didn't know how to say it the right way. And by everybody working and listening to each other and learning from myself, it helps everybody. And then eventually what I want to do with these people, what I'm doing with them is as they're growing, it goes from being, they move from being in a coaching program, which will keep on going as new people come in, into a mastermind where it's not me coaching them, it's me thing and everybody coming in, helping each other so that they can go to the next step together. It, together and apart at the same time. Yeah, that's the key, right? Like you said, you can't, it's hard to do this alone. You can't do it alone. Right. You can't do it really successfully alone. So bringing that element of community, right? right bringing people together right, to, right. to help each other. Help exactly. The, the, and you know, a lot of times people can get to six figures in coaching. And to get to six figures in coaching takes the right tools, the right systems. To get beyond six figures, you have to have the right mindset. It doesn't matter how good the tools are. It doesn't matter how good I am. But if you don't have the right mindset about yours, you're not going to go further. And then the last part, to make it grow even further, you have to be scalable. You have to understand that you can't do everything. And that's okay. As a mentor of yours and mine, whether they're direct mentors or indirect mentors, Robert Kiyosaki says, I want to be the dumbest guy in my business because I want, I want to surround myself with the people that know why, what they do better than me. And I say the people that know how work for and with the people that know why. So you want to find those people around you to help you grow the things that you don't know how to do. Your websites or uh, be generating magnets, whatever it is, and you focus on your greatness in coaching. Love it. Love it. So where is it? If people are out there thinking, okay, I need to get Martin on the phone or at least connect with him email or whatever's yeah, best, yeah, yeah. right? What are, what are the best places for people to learn more about these programs, right? Whether it's one-on-one -on -one coaching with you, right? To help them with the self-awareness piece, right? Which is completely what we talked about through this, this episode today, which has been fantastic. But then if, if there are coaches out there that yeah. are aspiring to help others, what are the best places for people to connect so, with you? I made it very simple. Connectwithmartin.com. 
can't get that's even that. Is. Yeah, that's where everything is. I have to tell you, oh, go to warrior to warrior slash. Blah, blah. You got to make it simple. K I S S. Keep it simple, sweetie. All right. <laughs> I've never heard of sweetie. I've heard stupid. <laughs> well, I never was being keep, nice. Keep... I was being nice. I'm saying if you're, I'm not calling your audience stupid. Are you calling your you're... audience stupid? No, I'm calling. I'm, I must have been thinking of myself as a Mets fan. That's all I can think of. <laughs> there you go. So go to connectwithmartin.com. There you can get my book. You can get my cards. You can click on a, a link to find out about my courses. And then I have another one just specifically to have a conversation about the guaranteed seven figure award program. Love it. So, folks, go out there, connect with Martin. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation today. We've tried to keep a little bit of fun. Uh, you know, I apologize for any of those New York fans that are on one side of the fence or the other. <laughs> I just think it's fascinating that that's even a thing. I never even knew it was. And then I keep asking and it is, which is, it's pretty funny and it's pretty cool at the same time. So if well, I don't want to offend. You Podunk, Indiana. There's only one team I out do. there. <laughs> there. Well, and it's not even really a team, is it? I mean, well, I shouldn't say that anyways. Not we're about the Knicks, to beat they the Knicks. are. <laughs> yeah, we're about ready to beat the Knicks, so it's all good. But anyways, yes, folks, hopefully you found a ton of value in this conversation. I knew that Martin and I would, would have a, a good time and then also try to add as much value as you possibly can to you as well. So I would recommend rewind this episode. Uh, Martin dropped a ton of wisdom in terms of self-awareness, uh, how to even work through some of those pieces of life. I've discussed many different times in the different episodes for myself. And he came to it with a different spin that I really loved. I can't wait to actually re-listen to it myself to try to implement some of these strategies in your life because that's the key is that when you become aware of it, even if it's for the first time, it's like you can't unsee it anymore. It's like you realize that, wow, there is a different way of living that isn't like everybody else. And it's okay. And it's actually a fantastic thing. You can actually, is it, that's why I wanted him to go a little deeper on some of the positive things that have happened because of this change. Mm. And I will tell you that those are the exact types of things that have happened for me as well. I wouldn't be able to be as aware with my family, with my friends, with this conversation today, had I not done the work and really gotten myself into a place where I'm in the driver's seat and taking control and that's what I would want to encourage you today on this episode and also moving forward. So go out there, connectwithmartin.com, right? Connectwithmartin.com. Definitely. Yes. Connectwithmartin.com. Go there and learn all about his different programs. Uh, learn from him. Grab his book. Try to get his, on his uh, mailing list of some kind and start getting in connection with him. Get close, close proximity as you possibly can. You'll be very surprised at how relatively quickly you'll be able to start transforming your life to this maybe a mundane situation to a, a really a dream life moving forward. And that's really what I wish for you uh, going forward. So once again, I appreciate your time and attention. If you found value in this message, I would love if you'd be willing to share it with your family and friends, uh, help us spread the message of the rich mind podcast. Maybe somebody needs to hear uh, from Martin today, and it would be a very much appreciated thing from both of us moving forward. So go out there, have a great day, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back to you with another interview again very soon. Until then, folks, bye now.